This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, and come on people, it's free, visit lynda.com slash WWII. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash WWII. Lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master Excel, learn negotiation tactics, build a website, or boost your Photoshop skills. That'd be me. Go to lynda.com and feed your curious mind. Some of the courses I recommend are the ones for WordPress and video and audio editing, but there's other more you know, day-to-day ones like Excel 2013 Power Shortcuts, Income Tax Fundamentals, and Going Paperless Start to Finish. I've been taking Lynda Doc courses on creating apps, website development, WordPress, things like that, and I really do like it. And for all my family members out there, you will be seeing tons of videos, well, crafted videos, on Disney World. For everyone else who is considering the free 10-day trial, with lynda.com membership, you get to watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. You can stream thousands of video courses on demand and learn on your own schedule, at your own pace. Courses are structured so you can watch them from start to finish or consume them in bite-sized pieces. You can browse each course transcript to follow along. Or, and this is what I've been doing, search for an answer and skip to that point in the video. You can also take notes and refer to them later. Download tutorials and watch them on the go, including on your iOS or Android device. And you can also, and this is my favorite part, you can create and save playlists of the courses you want to watch. And that way you can customize your learning path or share with your friends, colleagues, and team members. So, for those of you considering it, lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. So, whether you're looking to become an industry expert, or you're passionate about a hobby, say, I don't know, podcasting, or just want to learn something new, I want you to do yourself a favor and visit lynda.com slash WWII and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash W-W-I-I. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II Podcast, Episode 128, The End of Wavell, Battle Axe, and Exporter. Last time, while the first 48 hours of Battle Axe had not achieved all that Beresford Pierce or C&C Wavell had hoped for, the Germans had been stymied in their own way. Point 206, just on the British side of the barbed wire, had fallen, rather easily. Campuzo was now in British hands, and those men holding it had survived a counter-assault on the second day of battle. One of the gun positions on Hafford Ridge had been taken out, and the 5th Light Division had been unable to swing around Krieg's 7th Armored and attack the British position from behind. Nor had Major Bach at Halfaya been reinforced or resupplied, although he had been able to repulse two days' worth of attacks. So, as both sides planned for the third day of battle axe, each side's commanders sensed this day would tell the victor. Wavell certainly sensed this, so flew out from Cairo to Beresford Pierce headquarters, just in case he was needed to make a difficult decision, or keep Battleaxe's commanding officer offensively minded. Not that Beresford Pierce was one to run from a fight, but as Krieg was down to just 21 workable tanks, a tough decision was on the horizon. The battle could be kept going, but if those last tanks were lost on this day, the decision would be taken out of everyone's hands. Battle axe would be over. It would then be incumbent upon the British command structure to focus solely on the defense of Egypt. And though the British were not pushing Rommel back to Makili, they were blunting his sword, his ability to attack Egypt, even though he still held most of his ground. 
But what the British didn't realize, in some ways would not realize, until Monty was in charge in North Africa, was that most of their tanks that had been lost thus far, Churchill's Tiger Cubs, were not being used properly. And this partially explains their losses. The undertrained troops under Krieg were not putting their best foot forward when engaging the 5th Light Division. Their tanks were rushing ahead, not waiting for or using their accompanying artillery to best effect. Yes, it's daring, and I dare say romantic, to dash ahead in your armored steed to vanquish the enemy. But they, the Germans who had learned better, but even then never stopped seeking ways to improve their punching power, had their anti-tank guns ready and working closely with their tanks, infantry, and motorized troops. At times, especially during Operation Battle Axe, the Germans would even use their supply trucks as bait to lure the British forward with the thought of an easy kill and get them into range of their towed anti-tank guns. And this worked more than once, as it had on Halford Ridge, when the new cruisers were brought in close enough and then savaged. The German thinking was to use anti-tank guns to go after tanks, to use their tanks to kill enemy infantry, and their artillery to take out anti-tank guns and infantry. Complicated, perhaps, but not after much live practice and training. Yet the British found it hard until 1942, to uncompartmentalize their forces and truly work together, like an orchestra. With the exception of the jock columns, which come into the picture later, so will be covered then. The British really didn't learn to shake loose of their traditions until Monty came and used his aggressive personality to try new things and got his way. During the night of June 16th, after the second day of battle, Beresford Pierce had decided, again, to stick to his plan. How Faya would be attacked, again, it had to fall sometime. The 4th Armored Brigade would join the 7th Armored, as it was supposed to do on the 16th, but had found itself attacking Solemn instead, and succeeding there, while Krieg's tanks kept the 5th Light Division to the west. It was true that they were running out of tanks fast, but the Germans had to be as well. Constant pressure was the order of the day. As for Rommel's thinking, it was easy for him to see that Halfaya would be hit again, and so had to be supported, and that those British forces at Campuzo might try to push north, but they would end up looking foolish if Bach continued to stay in control of the pass, and the 5th Light, as well as the remaining tanks of the 15th Division, joined together behind the British front to advance on the pass. But one thing was for certain, it mostly always is in war. Rommel needed the British to spend the next day reacting to him, instead of carrying out whatever plans they had. So he decided to launch his armor well before sunrise. The 5th Light and the 15th Armored would join together, near City Suleiman, just to the south of the pass, and optimally either hit Capuzo in the rear or relieve Bach either would cripple the British offensive. And in the darkness, the first part of Rommel's plan succeeded. The 5th Light was able to turn east and dash to City Suleiman, while the 15th Armored made a feint at Campuzo, but then went 10 miles west of it and crossed into British territory. And since the British didn't know that Campuzo was not the real target, the 4th Armored had to once again stay with the 22nd Guards Brigade, which meant it never connected with the tanks of the 7th. The 5th Light managed to reach City Suleiman by 8 a.m., and everyone of rank in a British uniform realized this could be the turning point in a very bad way in the battle. This was above Krieg's paycheck, so he radioed Beresford Pierce, requesting that he fly to 7th headquarters and help assess the situation. Wavell's instincts had been correct not for the first time, and so he joined Beresford Pierce on his journey. As the RAF controlled the air, even to the point of being able to harass other German units trying to make their way south to help in the fight, the flight of the two top-ranking men wasn't as dangerous as it could have been. Still, it took time. 
The two men did not walk into Krieg's headquarters until 11.45 a.m., but by then it was too late. The decision was already out of their hands. To the north at Campuzo, and on the second day at Solomon, the British had been able to hold off the German armor, but were now running low on ammunition. Messervy, in charge of these two points, simply did not have the time in the last 48 hours to get supplies to his men. And if the Germans came at them now with their combined tank groups from the south, his men would not only not have enough shells to defend themselves, but also not have enough to fight their way out. Besides which, the 4th Armored, also in the area of Campuzo, finding itself equally threatened with being cut off, was running low on tanks. And they knew that if the infantry left, they would be forced to follow. With this being reported to Messervy, he decided on his own authority to order a withdrawal at 11 a.m., while Wavell and Beresford Pierce had been in flight. When Krieg brought the two ranking officers up to speed, Wavell knew it was impossible to countermand Messervy's decision. The men were already on the move and saw it for the prudent decision it was. So the CNC ordered a general withdrawal of the Western Desert Force. Their objective might not have been reached, but he had to think of tomorrow and what the rascally Rommel might do. The decision made, or rather reinforced, Wavell flew back to Cairo. The situation at Damascus was equally dismal and needed his attention. Meanwhile, the 7th Armored stayed with the 5th Light until City Suleiman, but then turned southeast to join the retreat. As the men and tanks of Campuzo and Solomon had moved out before anyone else, they made good time back southeast, south of the Halfaya Pass, while fighting their own running battle with the 15th Panzer Division. Rommel, of course, had intercepted Krieg's radio request for a senior officer to come to his headquarters and guessed that the British were in trouble and was hoping to close the trap on, at the very least, the enemy coming from Campuzo, but they were able to fight and retreat their way back to the British starting point. Rommel was furious and had his tanks scour the area, but the British withdrawal was complete. Operation Battleaxe was finished. Tobruk went unrelieved, and Rommel had redeemed himself in the eyes of Berlin. Not that he was going to receive massive amounts of reinforcements, now that Operation Barbarossa was about to be launched. The British had lost 1,000 men and almost half of their tanks, 27 cruisers and 64 heavy infantry tanks, thanks to Major Bach and his men. The Allies had taken out 700 German soldiers and an unrecorded number of Italians, as well as 50 Axis tanks. But because the Germans had won the field, in the coming days Rommel would gather what damaged tanks and supplies he could, including British tanks, and would use them in the future. And this would cause a lot of confusion. But for now, Rommel wasn't any more ready to attack along the El Alamein line than the British were ready to defend it. It was a stalemate. Both sides were, to a large degree, tankless. But then soon after, Brigadier Jock Campbell was put in charge of the 7th Support Group, and he created the Jock Columns, which contained a battery of field guns, a troop of anti-aircraft guns, a troop of anti-tank guns, and a company of motorized infantry. A combination of everything to hand, except tanks which allowed these columns to patrol no man's land and chastise any Axis forces that came close. No matter what the threat was, each column had something within its group that could handle the would-be invader. Of course, because they lacked tanks, they were not offensive by nature and rarely fared well when attacking first, except in hit-and-run ambushes. The Jacques columns had to hold the line until London could deliver enough tanks to replace what had been lost during Battle Axe and those in Operation Exporter, which seemed to be at least several months into the future. As the remaining forces of Battle Axe trudged east, the heart went out of almost everyone connected with the operation. These post-Operation Compass losses were understandable, as were the losses in Greece and Crete, if looked at correctly. 
the glaring lacks of security on radios, the attack coming at Rommel in a very traditional manner, trying to fight two battles at the same time. But everyone truly believed Battle Axe had the makings of another compass. That it didn't pan out that way left everyone bereft of the energy and the honesty to find out why it had failed. Besides the reasons for the defeat already listed, the British tank crews were not ready, because Churchill kept pushing for battle, even though it was prudent to wait. The tanks were not well adapted to the desert, certainly compared to what would be coming in the following year. And lastly, many of the British tanks, not that the Brits really knew this yet, were destroyed by towed anti-tank guns, not by German tanks fighting better. Rommel's forces had the long 50mm towed tank gun that could easily be hid, thus they weren't spotted enough to put two and two together. As for the soon-to-be-dreaded 88mm guns, Rommel only had 12 of those during Operation Battleaxe four on the Hoffet Ridge, and four with each of his two tank divisions. Still, they did their job well and confused the British, who were still trying to figure out exactly what took out their tanks. Yet there was one thing clear about Battle Axe. Wavell was out. When the CNC got back to Cairo, he cabled Churchill the following. Am very sorry for failure of battle axe and loss of so many tiger cubs, especially since I have realized from figures produced by liaison officer how short we are of requirements at home. Fear this failure must add to your anxieties. I was over optimistic and should have advised you that Seventh Armored Division required more training before going into battle. I should also have deferred exporter till we could put in larger force. But in both places, I was impressed by apparent need for immediate action. Now, one response to this could be, you mean this is what Churchill wrote to Wavell, right? But no, the prudent, cautious general was taking it on the chin, falling on his sword. But for that whole passage, the Prime Minister focused on one word, failure. Churchill replied on June 21st, I have come to the conclusion that public interest will best be served by the appointment of General Auchinleck to relieve you in command of the armies of the Middle East. The victories which are associated with your name will be famous in the story of the British Army and are an important contribution to our final success in this obstinate war. I feel, however, that after the long strain you have borne, a new eye and a new hand are required in this most seriously menaced theater. Again, one could counter with that the strain came not from his responsibilities, which were numerous to be sure, but not beyond Wavell's abilities, but from his boss in London, who wanted every possible theater invaded, wanted every enemy engaged, wanted many of these at the same time, and wanted them all ASAP. Yet Wavell did not fight. He did not bellow of the unfairness of it all he accepted his new role in India. But he was grieved that he was not allowed to return home for a few weeks before heading east. In all honesty, he might have talked. The war effort, i.e. Winston, could not have that. On the day after Winston's message, June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany invaded Stalin's USSR. What Auchinleck would face was worlds apart from what Wavell had been dealing with. But the more things change, the more they stay the same. Incredibly, and I say this more of a fan of Winston's than not, that as the Lend-Lease program of the United States started gearing up in regards to North Africa, that Germany was now committed to destroying the Russian war machine and its government and it was assumed by all that the Soviet Union would be crushed by fall, and that Nazi forces would be coming down into the Middle East from Turkey, if needs must, or by swinging east of the Black Sea. London, i.e. Churchill, again, saw this moment in time as the best one, the ideal one, to hit Rommel. Hard. One has to wonder if Churchill had any other gear except full speed ahead. 
but Cairo, i.e. Auchinleck and his officers, not to mention the other CNCs, saw things exactly the opposite. To their collective minds, now was truly the time to do what should have been done, the very steps spelled out in Wavell's last letter, post-Battle Axe, before exporter or Battle Axe was given the green light. Now is the time to build up forces, to train men, to try out new tactics, to get information back to those in Britain building the war machines about recommended changes after using said equipment in battle. If the Western Desert Army was damn near out of tanks, Rommel had to be hurting too. So no major offensive was expected of him. Why rush in, again, this time weaker than ever before, and end up losing more men and equipment, and finishing, probably without victory, even weaker, especially if the Germans could be coming south into Syria by late fall? It made no sense. But to Churchill, it did. He wanted Rommel pushed out of Cyrenaica, and it secured and he wanted Syria and Lebanon firmly in allied hands, as to be ready for the Germans, if they came that way. And overall, he was right. But the men and equipment were not in place at the moment to give these renewed attacks a solid chance of succeeding. And Winston was about to find out he wasn't talking to Wavell anymore. Tired he might have been, more like worn down by the Prime Minister. He was talking to Auchinleck, who easily figured out what had happened to his predecessor and attempted right off the bat to make damn sure it didn't happen to him. Just two weeks into Barbarossa, and best believe we will get to that soon, oh, won't we just, the new CNC sent his first assessment to London. On July 4th, Auchinleck set the record straight. London was told that before there was any talk of a new offensive. Egypt had to be secured, but that also meant that Syria had to be firmly in the hands of the Allies. Or securing the front door was meaningless if the back door wasn't locked, which meant that the Vichy forces had to be removed, which was underway, but time was needed. What's more, half force coming from Iraq was helping, but there was only so much that could be done in a day. Auchinleck also added that after aero reconnaissance of Rommel's dispositions, it had been determined that at least two, preferably three armored divisions, along with a motorized division, would be needed to secure Cyanaica. Churchill, taken aback, replied with, yes, Syria needed to be secured, but Cyanaica needed to be back in allied hands so the central Mediterranean could be protected, which increased Cairo's chances of getting supplies, and decreased Rommel's chances of getting resupplied. Which is kind of like saying, secure the area so we can protect the waterway and get you the supplies. Then we will give you the supplies you need to take the area. Fortunately, Auchinleck put it much better. His reply of July 15th said that he wanted an adequate number of tanks to get the job done, time to train his men, and work out superior ways of coordinating between the tanks and his men. Only then would he attack, perhaps in September, and he wanted a 50% reserve of tanks. Churchill shot back by restating his views and said on the side that this was an almost prohibitive condition. Generals only enjoy such comforts in heaven, and those who demand them do not always get there. So the cables flew back and forth, but Auchinleck wasn't worn down. He continued to write along the lines of, unless something incredible changes here, there will be no attack until September. And there will be no attack unless we get two, but better, three armor divisions. What's more, we want 150 cruisers here by September. And if we still control the skies, and if Rommel doesn't get any major reinforcements during this time, and if Syria is secure, an attack looks favorable. But just to be safe, let's say November. Then we can help Tobruk in some way, but only if we get what we want. No surprise here. This was too much for Winston. He decided it was time for a 
face-to-face, where real pressure could be brought to bear. So Auchinleck and the new RAF CNC Tedder flew to London. But Auchinleck stayed calm and eloquently spelled out his thinking and carried the day. The new agreement was thus. Operation Crusader, the next offensive plant, would not start until early November. Also, forces protecting the home island would be sent to the Middle East, which was Major General Norrie's 1st Armored Division. It would head for Cairo when it could. But at the very least, its 22nd Armored Brigade would be in Egypt by mid-September. And lastly, the RAF's order of battle would see an increase of 52 squadrons from its current 34 and a half by mid-October. Here was real progress and a realistic view of the coming battle. Now, Syria just had to be settled. When we left off with Operation Exporter, pretty much every front had come to a halt. The Australians were held up along the coast. The Vichy forces had counterattacked and retaken some areas in central Syria. While the back of the 5th Indian Brigade had been broken at Damascus. Not to mention the Free French were still hung up on the road to Damascus at Kiswi. But now that Battle Axe was over, not in a good way, forces could be transferred from the Western Desert Front to the front line above Palestine. And what was being moved was enough to organize it as a new corps, called the First Australian, under the command of General Laverick. These men moved north and were able to support the whole front that had started in Palestine. These new units, along with the forces already in-country, forced the Vichy to release Damascus. But really, they were moving to other, even better defended positions, one to the north and one to the northwest. But that wasn't the end of Operation Exporter Phase 2. As Iraq had been settled down, parts of Force that had helped secure the area, and still under that name, were coming west, and due to the geography, it was clear to the Vichy that Habforce would be coming at homes far north of Damascus, a major center. But first, they would have to get past the defensive perimeter at Palmyra, some 100 miles east of Homs. On June 13th, Habforce was told to get ready to move. But for whatever reason, this took four days. Yet, once assembled, they still needed three more days to move out. Meanwhile, the 10th Indian would stay in Iraq and keep things calm. The idea was to send all of Hapforce, but to have the household cavalry break off and advance any more southerly route. This was hoped to surprise the enemy, but Vichy Air Reconnaissance was doing a thorough job and had spotted the more southern group and bombed them into confusion. Still, the two groups came on only to be stymied by those Vichy forces sent to oppose them. The defenders were smaller in number, but determined. The aggressors, with more manpower, seemed less focused, certainly less motivated, and got hung up for a week. And this stalemate might have gone on longer. But as Vichy reinforcements coming from the north were attacked and made to turn around, the morale of the defending forces in the east sank. So Palmyra surrendered. The legionnaires got drunk, and the other half of the force, the local Arabs, simply went home. So Palmyra was open, but after a week of being held up, the attackers were exhausted. This lack of progress coincided with the other fronts showing no real movement either. The Aussies along the coast, the Free French trying to come at homes from the south, after Damascus had fallen and those of the mixed nationalities in the center trying to come north and, of course, have force. With such a stalemate, the only thing that could break it was an endgame move, and that could only be to take the Vichy headquarters at Beirut. But in an attempt to stop this, French Admiral Darlan tried in vain to send reinforcements to Syria, but most were stopped by British air or sea power, which begged the question for Vichy, do we dare ask Germany for help? Yet that had been decided for them, as German units were pulled out of the area, via Turkey, and either ended up 
participating in Operation Barbarossa or further strengthening their positions in Greece or the Balkans. So there would be no German help, and the only other friend Vichy had was the supposed neutral United States. But if Vichy attacked British troops with German help, that friendship would come to an end, toot sweet. So the Vichy stuck to their guns, doing reasonably well. But over the days and then weeks, it became a numbers game. The forces at Merjayon were pulled back, which let the Aussies move in. But still, there was no advance in the direction of Beirut. On June 23rd, de Gaulle moved into the recently fallen Damascus with the intent of setting up his headquarters. But there would be no Free French or British headquarters in the area. London was quite serious when it said, before the fighting had started, that their aim was to set up an independent Syria and Lebanon. Whether they joined the Allies was another question for the future. But for now, any non-Allied or foreign power was going to be pushed out. As for the main Australian thrust along the coast, those forces had been held up at the Darmour River for days, and those days stretched on. Each time they tried to move, all they got for it were more dead. This was not French bravado, but desperation. Indian forces from Iraq were coming west, north of Beirut, trashing everything in their way, obviously wanting some payback for their comrades who perished at Damascus. So no matter what was happening along the Damour, Beirut would fall just from the north instead of the south. By this time, the Vichy were outmanned, three to one. What's more, by now the British Navy controlled the coast, yet some French ships did manage to make good their escape. The French Air Force, as admirable as their fighting had been, had simply run out of fuel or had been bombed by British air or naval power. But having all but won the war, it was time to actually win it. Three Australian brigades were poised to take Beirut. The 21st would attack across the river, not to actually win the day, but to act as a diversion and pin down French forces. Meanwhile, the 25th would come at the enemy's inland flank and turn it as they captured gun position after gun position along the hills. And by the time the 25th was exhausted in trying to cross the River de Moor and rush the French, this would mean the defenders would be equally tired. Then the 17th, the 3rd Brigade, still fresh, would charge in and take the city. This was all very possible and rather straightforward. On paper, units designated with arrows showing their advances. In reality, it was a different matter. The attacking of the flank took three days and many more Aussie lives than accounted for, before the men were able to come upon the main French defensive line. But even then, with the 25th being stopped cold from any advance, and having the 17th called up to join them, it still took two more days of fighting before any advance could be made along the main front. Only by the night of July 8th did the French line crack, but not completely break, which forced General Dents that morning, July 9th, to ask the American Consul General in Beirut to act as a go-between to start the conversation of an armistice. The fighting stopped at midnight, July 11th. Yet the talks were just as acrimonious as the fighting had been. Dents used the time of the talks to send out all of their aircraft back to France or North Africa. The remaining French ships were to be in turn in Turkey. Three British ships that had been captured were sunk in the Beirut harbor. And destroying any chance of avoiding ill will, not that that was possible between the two sides, all the British officers, who were now POWs, were to be flown back to France to remain POWs. As for the free French, who were not allowed at the talks, they demanded a clause that said, all the Vichy soldiers must have the choice of joining de Gaulle's side. But before this could be moved further along, the British then found out about their brother officers being moved during the talks, which was bad form in the least, 
and on their way to France. The British, being typically polite up to this point, then turned on the Vichy French and arrested everyone they could get their hands on, including those at the meeting. This changed the attitude of the Vichy officials, who had the prisoners released. With this done, it was now time for the Vichy soldiers to choose where they would go. 32,000 officers and men returned to France with Dents, who was proclaimed a hero, while only 2,600 joined de Gaulle. Epilogue. With the end of Operation Exporter, no one was happy. The Vichy certainly weren't. The Free French weren't. The Germans, even less so, as well as the British. They had learned that de Gaulle and his cohorts might talk big, but didn't fight big, and wanted all of the fruits of others' labors. But when no one is happy, that's normally a sign of a good compromise. De Gaulle went on trying to force his position in Syria, which basically forced the British to stay in command there politically. Well, that and to keep the Syrians and the French people away from each other, who seemed only to want to fight. But for now, the Germans were being kept out, and that's all that mattered. Over the next few years, a series of anti-French riots would break out until the British were at the end of their patience. Locking the French soldiers in their barracks, the British then signed a document of Syrian independence in May of 1945. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So I just want to thank a couple people, and then I will let you go on your way. First of all, as far as people who have bought mugs recently, I'd like to thank Lorna D. from Los Angeles, California, Sarah D. from Bowling Green, Kentucky, and Amin K. from the UK. So, so thank you very much. And then I would like to thank John C. for buying a CD, Volume 1, for his brother Dan in Southern California. So thank you, John. And lastly, I'd like to say hello to my new members, Joseph D. of New Brunswick, Canada, and Hannah S. of Burnley, UK. So again, thank you very much to everybody who's supporting this show. I hope you like the last one I put out that only came out four days after the one before that, so I'm trying to focus on this more despite my crazy schedule and just give you more episodes more often because I know it's it sucks to wait, so I'll try to do better. Take care, everyone.